I'd like to offer three conclusions, two caveats, and one arithmetic insight. Um, the three conclusions are, and I'll be quick, uh, one, <clears throat> It's my belief that the rebalancing of the real economy, something we've been talking about for a long time, um, is largely but not completely on track. It's going slowly, uh, but it's moving in the right direction. Uh, the service sector is, um, uh, is growing rapidly, but consumer demand uh, is not increasing its share of GDP in any appreciable way yet. Personal income is starting to increase as a share of Chinese GDP, but the income is still being at the margin, uh, uh, showing up more in the form of saving rather than uh, uh, spending. The missing piece in this translation from services to consumption, from income to reduced saving, uh, I believe is uh, the need to um, place greater emphasis on the social safety net uh, and I do believe that the 13th five-year plan, which will be unveiled this coming weekend, uh, will uh, feature significant initiatives along that line. My um, second conclusion is while I'm optimistic uh, and constructive on the rebalancing of the real economy, I would be the first to concede that financial reforms are not on track. Uh, the bursting of the equity bubble is a classic example of that. Uh, and the poor communication of the recent changes in foreign exchange uh, policy are also uh, uh, disturbing in that regard. Thirdly, um, I think the markets, financial markets in, in general, have been wrong in viewing China as a classic uh, uh, emerging markets currency crisis along the lines of what we saw in Asia in the late 1990s. Um, there has been capital flight. There has been a significant reduction of foreign exchange reserves. But at $3.2 trillion in foreign exchange reserves, which is 23 times what China had back in the late 1990s, um, it's gotten more than enough to deal uh, with um, uh, the fears of uh, capital flight. It's running a current account surplus, not a deficit, and has very little uh, in the way of short-term hot money from abroad uh, that could head for the exits. My two caveats are, number one, um, this may sound heretical as a, uh, a market practitioner, but uh, financial markets, in my opinion, lack anything close to the intellectual capacity to understand China. Um, for example, you know, this fixation on headline GDP misses most of what's going on in China which is significant shifts in the mix of the GDP. And secondly, my second caveat is to be wary of um, mechanistic applications of other historical precedents. So many people look at China, they look at debt to GDP ratios, and uh, you know, they look at risks to the, to the banking system and say, well, China must be Japan, or it must be, uh, um, you know, um, uh, Venezuela or, you know, United States pre-crisis. Uh, uh, these examples are not relevant uh, to China. Final point I'd make is my <laughs> brilliant arithmetical insight. Um, and I do that to try to assess the balance between the cyclical pressures that are now bearing down on China um, and the structural forces uh, which are guiding China and likely to guide China over the longer haul. So here's, here's what I suggest you do if you, if you think China is going to crash. Uh, do the math. Services right now are 50.5% of the Chinese GDP, uh, and um, that's 25% larger than the combined share going to construction uh, and manufacturing. Moreover, services... Uh, through the uh, fourth quarter of last year are growing nearly 40% faster uh, than manufacturing and construction. So what's this mean? It means if services were to slow, um, uh, and so far they haven't slowed significantly, but if they were to slow from their current growth rate of 8.3 to 7, which is, I think, a pretty big slowdown, and the manufacturing and construction sectors, which are under cyclical pressure, cut their growth rate in half. 
currently six, cut it to three. The answer still, um, doing the math and plugging in the weights, is 6% uh, GDP growth uh, in, in China. The math does not suggest uh, that you're going to get a, um, uh, a hard landing. My first point is that uh, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, so we all agree uh, that uh, you know, after more than 30 years of uh, fast economic growth, many, many structural problems have been accumulated. Too much debt, uh, too much capacity, too much uh, investment, and too much government involvement in all the different things, and too many bubbles. So, so that's my fir first point. Uh, second point uh, is about uh, how big uh, the debt problem really is. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to quote too many statistics for you, um, but if we use just a, a non-financial uh, corporate debt to GDP ratio, as an example, you know, now it's about uh, uh, 1.7 times GDP uh, in terms of total non-financial corporate debt. Whereas uh, eight, eight years ago, so at the end of uh, 2008, uh, or at the beginning of 2008, uh, it was almost exactly 100% of uh, GDP. So from one times GDP uh, for the total uh, non-financial corporate debt, <laughs> to now 1.6 to 1.7 times over this uh, seven year, eight year period, an increase of almost 70%. Uh, so no other country in the world uh, has uh, run up debt uh, like this. Uh, so this is something you have read quite a bit, uh, quite a, uh, a lot over the last few months uh, as uh, international markets have been interpreters again for whatever reasons coming out of China. Uh, so that's my second point. Uh, the debt problem uh, is really big. And uh, some of you may think, well, the government and others in China must be very busy uh, deleveraging. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite. Uh, that is still being the main instrument uh, for growth, uh, which is not too surprising because given that uh, more than 80% of uh, financial resources in China are in the banks, uh, so debt is the main way uh, to really get capital, uh, which is a result of the uh, structure of the financial system in China. So my third point is about uh, the question, you know, will there be a Lehman-style financial crisis uh, in China? Uh, this is, uh, you know, much of the talk uh, has been uh, focused on, including a lot of hedge fund managers. Uh, no, uh, it's highly unlikely uh, for an American-style uh, financial crisis to occur in <clears throat> China, uh, even though debt and other financial leverage uh, are pretty high. Uh, you know, Japan is actually a good uh, uh, example, a good reference point. You know, Japan has been stay, uh, you know, at a very high level in terms of leverage and non-performing uh, investments, this and that. Uh, but Japan has not had a financial crisis. Uh, pretty much for the same reason that I would like to say about China. Uh, the best way to understand this is, um, you know, just imagine that uh, um, the Chinese government has a super uh, uh, stabilization fund. So whenever a new Lehman oh, or this and that uh, would come up uh, to up, uh, you know, threaten the uh, financial system in China, uh, the Chinese government is never really, uh, 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 you know, there to hesitate even for a second to come in to, uh, uh, to bail out. So when the government has the resources backed by uh, pretty much all the land, uh, you know, as many of you know, uh, all the land in China is owned directly or indirectly uh, by the government uh, at different levels. Uh, so when you have that big resource there to really uh, 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 save uh, for or even force lenders to actually uh, take some cuts uh, or, 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 or sometimes the government uh, agencies would come in to save uh, uh, the insolvent uh, borrowers directly, then uh, this kind of uh, uh, attempt or effort right, can make um, financial panic very difficult to actually uh, build on itself. So this is why without financial panic, uh, the Lehman Brothers style uh, financial crisis is highly unlikely uh, to occur. 
But in the end, uh, it has to be a fiscal crisis that uh, bring the economy and the society into real big trouble. So this is why I would watch for two things. One, the real estate uh, prices uh, level, and then whether there is a real estate bubble. So this is the first thing to watch for, because that determines how much leverage, how much room the local governments really have uh, to uh, save uh, uh, trouble, uh, uh, you know, troubled uh, uh, borrowers. The second thing to watch for really is the physical condition of the government. So that's my third point. The fourth point, quickly, uh, what do I see going forward for the next five years? I would say the best case scenario is a uh, Japan style uh, lost decade. So in the sense that, uh, you know, if, if the government actually can do a good job to prevent a crisis from occurring. I would give them my highest score uh, in terms of performance evaluation, because it's really tough uh, to achieve that, uh, to achieve like between one and 2% growth uh, for the next five to 10 years. Uh, but the more likely scenario is actually hard landing. I know Steve does not want to use this word.